Yep, got it. All right, good to see everyone. A, a Wednesday night without weather. What a deal, huh? Yeah. But well, we have plenty of weather. We have plenty of weather. Not, not the kind of weather that would keep us from meeting. So a couple of folks have asked, uh, we were planning going eight weeks, given that we've lost two. We had already had plans for some Wednesday night offerings post Ash Wednesday, and I don't want to bump those folks. So we're, this is our last time. Um, what I might do is cover some of the stuff that I was planning on doing, and then I can po we can post that online, and you can watch if you wanted to. I could do a narrated PowerPoint, something like that, um, and uh, cover a couple of things that we're not going to be able to get to. I do want to say uh, next week is uh, Ash Wednesday, and we're uh, doing uh, an Ash Bash. Would encourage folks to to come along for that, and then the week after that, um, Terry is going to be doing a four week Lent series on Wednesday nights, and so would encourage you to come for that. And um, uh, that's the, I think that's the only thing that's being offered in that stretch. And then uh, a little bit later on in the spring, Steve's gonna do a series on Israel, kind of a, uh, Israel and the monarchy. So mm -hmm. a bit of Old Testament history and theology from Steve. And there's one other thing that we're gonna do, but it's slipping my mind right now. So keep your eyes on, uh, on the emails for all the different offerings that we're going to be having on Wednesday nights. So uh, let me go ahead and pray and then we can jump in. Father, we thank you for this time together. Um, we do pray as we um, reflect together on the things that we have before us tonight, that you would uh, be with us, that you would uh, encourage us. And God, as we think about what it means to be your church in this time, and in this place, with the challenges that we have and the opportunities that we have, our prayer certainly is uh, for you to, uh, in the power of your spirit, to form this local community into a church that witnesses well to the gospel of Jesus. And we pray that you would be honored in all of these things. And we ask them in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 All right, so what we're going to do tonight is I'm kind of combining a couple of things. I hadn't quite finished the, uh, the evangelicalism and politics a couple weeks ago. So I want to finish out some thinking on that. Uh, and then we're going to move into some thinking around uh, evangelicalism and race. Um, and so kind of combining some big things here and yeah. hope to at least get some uh, thoughts going and some conversation going and then uh, you know we probably aren't going to solve these issues tonight but we can hopefully at least uh, have some good thinking together so all right so we've been thinking about the crisis of evangelicalism over the last few weeks uh, crisis of identity crisis of mission we don't know who we are and therefore we don't know what we're here to do um, in having that confusion of identity and mission um, we have as the evangelical church been tempted to give ourselves to lots of different things that um, I've been suggesting maybe aren't really at the core of, of who we are and what we are here to do so we've been thinking about identity uh, mission and then started into thinking about politics a couple weeks ago and I'll recap some of that and then finish that out so uh, my thesis has been that the crisis of evangelicalism is rooted in the evangelical church's lack of a good understanding of what it means to be the church. That we haven't had a good understanding, a good theology of the church, uh, and we've gone through reasons why that is. So I've been suggesting that a better understanding of what it means to be the church can help us in the conversations we're having about what it means to be evangelical and what it means for us to think about what we are in the future and what, what the church is in the future. So we started a couple weeks ago to talk about um, evangelicalism and politics. And then we were uh, doing some thinking on, on defining politics. I, I put the famous quote from Aristotle up uh, that um, humanity is a political animal. Uh, and by political there, we mean communal. Right? That, that we by nature uh, live in communities with, with others. Uh, and Aristotle in that quote basically says 
if you don't need to live in community, you're either a beast or a god. Humans need to live in communities with one another. It's, it's part of our constitution. It's part of who we are as people. Uh, and there are theological reasons why that's the case. There are philosophical reasons why that why that's the case. We don't need to get into all of that. But So I, I then defined politics as the ordering of communal life with the aim of thriving. The ordering of communal life. So if we're going to live well together, we have to have order to our life with one another. And we have to have an aim. What is it that we are as humans? What is it that we're about? What is our, our communal life oriented towards? What are we seeking? What are we pursuing? In, in philosophical terms, what is the good life? How do we define the good life? So the ordering of communal life with the aim of human thriving. And uh, I suggested a couple weeks ago that that necessita necessitates a couple of things. One, it necessitates a communal understanding of thriving. How do we agree as a community what it means to thrive as humans? And if you don't have at least a, a, some kind of shared understanding of what thriving means, then it becomes very difficult to hold community together. So you have to have a communal understanding of, of thriving. And then you also have to have structures that aim to promote that thriving. You have to have certain authority structures. You have to have uh, structures of um, law enforcement that keep the, uh, the things that would take away our pursuit of thriving, that would hinder that. You have to have structures in place to pursue human thriving. So we have to have a communal understanding of thriving, and we have to have structures uh, that aim to promote that thriving. We then spent a little time thinking about the crisis of Western liberalism, we celebrated a bit that the evangelical church isn't the only, we're not the only ones in crisis. Um, the concept of Western liberalism is in a time of crisis, and there's lots of different commentary about what that looks like, uh, why that is, what are the signs and the symptoms of that, what are the underlying root causes of that. Uh, and I, I quoted Patrick Deneen, who wrote a book called Why Liberalism Failed, and his, his uh, idea is that liberalism has failed because it has succeeded. <laughs> that what we're living in is the, uh, the core concepts of liberalism that underscore Western democracy, that those concepts are being taken to their logical conclusion. And what is happening in that is that with that comes a growing realization of contradictions that are becoming more and more apparent in the Western world, in, in, in Europe and in the United States, growing realization of these contradictions in liberal political theory. And again, just to be clear, when I say liberal here, I don't mean uh, liberal Bernie Sanders or whoever you want to put there versus conservative Ronald Reagan or whoever you want to put there. I don't mean that spectrum of liberal to conservative, I mean liberalism as a political philosophy that undergirds the Western political structures. Okay. So we're seeing these contradictions that are, that are uh, coming more and more to, uh, to be evident in our society and in the way that, that uh, people and groups are, are interacting with one another. Uh, there's a faith that's at the core of liberalism as a political philosophy. And the faith is that innumerable autonomous individuals pursuing their own interest can create a harmonious society. This is kind of the gamble of liberalism, of, of, of the philosophy of liberalism. Liberalism defines humans as autonomous individuals. Um, and the idea is that autonomous individuals, by nature, are self-interested. And so what liberalism risks is that you can create a harmonious society when all of these innumerable autonomous individuals or groups 
are seeking their own self-interest, that, that will work together ultimately to create a harmonious society. And what people are suggesting is happening right now is this risk is being, we're starting to see some of the challenges of this and the risk is not paying off currently in the way that our social structures are, are working together or are, are operating together. And so you have this faith in, in, in liberal philosophy, liberal political philosophy, but this faith is not being returned and it's not accomplishing uh, what it set out to accomplish. So what is that? What is going on? Well, as, as liberalism defines the right of the individual to pursue happiness, um, then what we're seeing is that if each individual is enabled to pursue happiness as they defined it, then you lose a sense of a shared thriving. Thriving becomes something I define for myself as an individual, but what we're seeing in the society in which we live is a sense of an overarching shared understanding of what it means to thrive, that that is what is being lost. And a lot of what's being declared and thought through, as we talked about this a couple weeks ago, is that really never in Western society has everyone had an agreement about what it means to thrive. There has been certain groups in power who have defined what it means to thrive for them, and others have been used to support that definition of thriving. And now what's happening is those others who have been used to support a certain group's definition of thriving are standing up and saying, we're not going to do this anymore. We have, you have built this vision of thriving on the backs of others, and now those others are in position like they haven't been before to pursue political power, to pursue uh, different definitions of thriving for their groups. And so that's challenging the power structures of the, of the culture, and it's creating uh, more of a, uh, a atomized social structure in which groups not sharing a common sense of overall what it means to thrive are pursuing power. So we're seeing lots of power dynamics going on in the culture. So each individual has the right to determine what it means for that person to thrive. What's the role of the government then in that? The role of the government is to ensure each individual's right to pursue their own happiness, to pursue their own definition of, of what it means to thrive. Becky. Yeah. I think this makes me think of it, it because it's so individual that it's going to automatically lead to conflict because if I have the right pursue my happiness, it might interfere with your right, <clears throat> right to pursue your right. happiness. Yeah. And it reminds me, I think it's in orthodoxy that Chesterton writes about freedom doesn't mean everybody's free to do whatever they right. want because right. then you're going to have anarchy. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, and that's exactly, I mean, that's exactly what I think as a culture we're working through right now and trying to figure out right now. Because, and I do think this is a dynamic that's important, and it certainly plays into the conversation about the church and race, but I think it is an important dynamic to recognize that the shared sense of thriving in American history has been, been determined by certain groups in power. Um, and now as that, those groups are, as the power of those groups are waning and others are seeking that power, then this is where you get into these conversations about how do we determine what thriving is? Who gets to determine what thriving is? Can we even have a shared overall sense of thriving? Is that even possible in the kind of culture that, that we live in? Um, and, and those are, there are very significant philosophical, sociological, political philosophy conversations going on right now, trying to figure out what, what does it look like 
truly for a, a, a nation that is made up of lots of different groups who have lots of different visions of what it means to thrive. How do you do that? And I think that is a, a challenge that our culture, not the, the United States culture, we see this happening in Europe. And the immigration conversation is tied up in all of this uh, very significantly. So does that, Becky's um, statement, assume that something like happiness or thriving is is a quantity, a limited good? Uh, yeah. Or, or can, is there an alternative to that assumption? That, uh, so I, I think um, I think that is a great uh, philosophical question about what what happiness is, who defines what happiness is. Um, you know, I, I, I think the immigration question I, is, a, is a, this is really at the crux of what's going on. Particularly, you've seen this in Europe, right? As you've had countries in Europe that have tended to be fairly homogenous in their population. We have a fairly clear definition of what us means, who then now have waves of immigrants coming in and are seeing that as a threat to what it means to be us. And, our, and different countries are, have been reacting in different ways. Um, but it's that, what is that shared sense of us? What does that mean? Um, and, and so I think the pursuit of happiness is one way to define it. Another way is just simply to define it as when we think about who we are, who, who, who are we? Who is us? And how do other people get integrated into us? So think about in, in France where there was, has been a law passed against any kind of religious, wearing religious symbols mm -hmm. in public, which then includes burqas, um, you know, Muslim dress. Mm -hmm. So then that becomes a very significant question about what does us mean? If it is core to the identity of a Muslim to wear a burqa, but they're not allowed to do that in the public sphere here, then who's defining that and who is the us that is determining what that proper code of conduct is. Does that have a right to call itself a liberal? Uh, well, I, and, and I think that is, entity. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I think that, that you know, who is us? That's a, that's, that's a big, big, big question. And that's an ecclesial question that we are talking about because I think as the church, we should define who is us very differently than the markers that we tend to use to define who is us. But that, that starts to move us into the question of, of the church and race and, and that kind of thing. So we'll hold off on that. Okay, now there's been an assumption in Christianity that the church is called to translate a biblical vision of politics into the larger culture. And I've, I've talked about this a fair bit in other series that I've done, um, Christendom and the church in power and kind of our ability to, to seek to translate a vision of politics and, and, and bring that into the larger culture. Uh, we, we were kind of winding down last week thinking about this question. What if the scriptures don't contain a political philosophy? I think we need to question the assumption that the scriptures contain a political vision for the larger culture. I think the scriptures contain a political vision that political vision is the church. It's not a political vision that we then translate into the broader society. Yes? I'm just curious, when we think about the assumption of Christianity. Yeah. So certainly I think we can see the effects of that in our country. And yeah. I can think historically where that's been true in some countries. Is is it only historically true for countries where Christianity has been the dominant religion? Or is this, I mean, do you think this is an actual marker of yeah, it's all a, Christians everywhere? I, I don't think it is. I think it is an assumption of, of Western Christendom Christianity. Uh, I don't think it's been, it, hasn't, it wasn't an assumption of the early church. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it's an assumption of, of the church where the church hasn't been in, in power. Um, though I do think you see in things like in Latin America, in liberation theology, you do see some places where the church has been marginalized, people 
the church been marginalized, who then view something like liberation theology as a, a means toward political transformation. Um, but I don't think it, I, I guess I would say this, I don't think it has to be the assumption of the church, but I think it has tended to be the assumption of the church, certainly in power, but even as it's been uh, farmed out to other places that has tended to be the way that has gone that the church has sought political power. It wasn't a marker of the early church. Yeah. In your opinion and or research, can yeah. you point to a, a time in history when you feel like that changed? Yeah, I think the the kind of the the, the watershed is Constantine you know, Constantinian Christianity is another way that this has been described, where, and you can see the church kind of growing in its strength prior to that in the late third century, but it's in the fourth century when Constantine makes, Constantine makes Christianity no longer to be illegal. It was illegal up to, to Constantine. And this is the three, 315, 320, right around this. And then in th about, uh, 381, 380, 381, you may know that better than me, Clarence, around that time is when Christianity was declared to be the official religion of the Roman Empire. So it's in that time period, the 4th century, that the, the church uh, steps into power. And, and there's um, a lot of what's going on there is the, the Roman Empire is starting to disintegrate. There's a power vacuum. Who's going to step into that power vacuum? And the, the church is the entity that steps into that power vacuum. Yeah. So the fall of Rome really kind of solidified that because there wasn't anyone in charge in Europe except right. the barbarians. The, the barbarians were coming and, and uh, so a lot of those wreaking havoc. looked to the churchmen to say, how do I organize society? And, and the church was starting to structure itself in with bishops. So there was, a, there was a, an authority structure already building <coughs> that then when the Roman authority structure <coughs> fell, the church authority structure was kind of in place to, to take over. Yeah. And there are conversations about whether the church should have done that. <laughs> what else could the church have done other than that? And I think those are great conversations. I think we're on the far side of that now. And with the waning of that, what do we do? What is our role? What, how do we understand ourselves? And, and I do think we have an opportunity to go back to learn from the early church about what their understanding of what their presence was in the culture and to maybe recapture some things about the church that we've lost because we haven't been reading the scriptures through the vision of the early church. We've been reading it through the vision of Western Constantinianism. I think you, you, you read different passages differently if you're a church in power than if you're a church that's not in power. So. Okay, so what if scriptures don't contain a political philosophy? I, we talked about this. I, I think we certainly see there's a vision of Israel as a covenant polis, uh, a, a covenant community under God's rule. Right? Israel was supposed to be a theocracy. There is a vision of the church in the scriptures as a covenant people under God's rule. The church is to be a theocracy. God is our, uh, our ruler. I don't think you see a vision of the nation state as a covenant polis under God's rule. Nation states aren't supposed to be theocracies in the, in the biblical vision of the, of the people. Um, nation states aren't meant to be theocracies. So what does this mean for our presence? I think it means that we are called to be a non-competitive, non-authoritarian presence in the world. What I mean by that is we are not to compete for the powers of the state as the means of establishing a vision of our vision of thriving our ecclesial, our polis, our community, we have as the church a particular vision of thriving. I don't believe that the scriptures give us warrant 
for pursuing the mechanism of the state as the means by which we are to bring in and impose upon others our vision of thriving. So when I say a non-competitive, I mean, I don't think the church is a competitor for worldly power in the marketplace of different ideas of what it means to thrive, that we are not to adopt the powers of the state as the means of establishing our vision of what it means to thrive. And, and I've, I've done this in a couple of different contexts with Jesus and Pilate. I did a series last Easter around Jesus and Pilate. I've, I've talked about that in here. That's a very instructive um, paradigm for me of how we see Jesus uh, very clearly demonstrating that his kingdom is not of this world. It's not a worldly power. So Jesus wasn't competing with Pilate. Jesus wasn't trying to take Pilate's role. Jesus wasn't trying to overthrow Pilate in order to establish another rule in Pilate's place. He very clearly chose not to do that. He, he very intentionally chose that he wasn't going to pursue that path, though he was offered that path. And when there's a couple of stories in the Gospels where people come and they want to make Jesus king. Remember this? Right? They want to come and crown Jesus king. You remember what Jesus does? He hightails it out of there. Right? He heads, he goes, in, 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 I think it's in two places where that is described. And what it says is that he goes to be alone. He, he leaves that and goes to be alone with, with his father to continue to pursue his presence in the world, which was not an authoritarian impositional presence. You don't see Jesus competing for political power. Now, say at the same time, Jesus is a threat to all old worldly power, but not as a immediate competitor to that worldly power. What Jesus does is he creates a community that calls people out of pursuing those worldly powers in order to inhabit a community that is a sign of the kingdom that is not of this world. Clarence, yes? How then would you evaluate movements such as the moral majority? <coughs> um, I have, I have very significant problems with movements such as the moral majority um, um, because I think those tend towards seeking to take a biblical vision of what the church is called to be and impose that upon worldly structures in a way that I think is very problematic uh, and confuses the church and the state confuses the new and the old yeah. How Dave. far do you take that? So as a citizen of the United States yeah. of America, do I vote? Do I, uh, That's an excellent question. Do I get involved in uh, certain things? So that leads us right into oh. the next, right into the next conversation, okay? Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. So I think um, that we we need to make a clear distinction between the kingdom of God and the common good. And a lot of the reading I do these days around church and state and Christians and political engagement, I think conflate these things and confuse these things. And, and the kingdom of God is, dis, is, which I think is distinct from the common good, is confused with the common good. And so that's why I want to spend a little time on unpacking here. Yes? I'm just wondering, so in this day and age, much like the term liberalism yeah. has a, a view that you need to just specify, yeah. uh, do you want to elaborate on what you mean by the common good? I have a definition in two slides. Excellent. <laughs> yes, yes, I do. Should have read ahead. There you go. No, don't. That's, that's best. So real quick, <laughs> let me just say that this is my, so this is kind of my, my working assumption here, okay? And I'm... Um, I'm, this is one of those places where I am proposing something that I've thought through, but I haven't, I don't, I don't feel as confident in this as I do other things that I've thought through because I'm still thinking it through. It's a part of a writing, some writing that I'm doing, so I'm kind of 
putting it out there to, to see how it sounds, right? Matt, I've said this before, a lot of why I do these classes, it ain't for you, it's for me <laughs> to be able to think through stuff and say stuff and then like, oh, I, then I, when I say it out loud, go, oh, no, 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 that's not what it, that's not at all what I mean. But, so I'm kind of doing that with this. So, uh, give me a little little rope here to kind of work through some things. I'm just, I'm doing some, some of my own thinking out loud here. So, I think that a lot of the reasons why the church pursues political power is because we have this confusion between the kingdom of God and the common good. And we have, we have conflated these two things. Uh, the kingdom of God is very clearly a biblical concept. The common good, it's not really spelled out in the biblical text. It is a um, philosophical concept. I think it's a valuable, I think it's helpful. It's not a biblical concept that has been spelled out. There's one verse that people always go to on this, and it's the verse where Israel is sent into exile, and they're sent into exile in Babylon, and it says, seek the good of the city. Right? That, that verse is, is one that, in my view, has been freighted with way too much theological import around how we understand what the presence of the church is in the world. Um, and I think a big a, a theology of common good has built up around that verse that I think is not in line with how I think we should be thinking about our relationship to the world around us. But, all right, the, the confusion of kingdom of God and common good has led the church to view political power as the means for quote unquote changing the world or bringing in the kingdom that we because of this idea of the common good we have seen structures of the culture, political structures as the place where we are to see the kingdom of God being built and uh, I, I don't think that's what the biblical text presents to us. Okay, so defining the common good. And this is a pretty, a, a pretty short definition. There's more we can unpack with this, but defining the common good. What is shared and beneficial for all or most members of a given community? What is shared and beneficial for all or most members of a given community? community. So let's just talk about that but, definition. That's why the priests have salvation army. Oh, the salvation army. Yep, yep. It is. The common good is the common good is very important in the salvation army. Yep, yep. Um, lots of different, lots of different places. You have uh, this, this emphasis on the common good. And I think we should have an emphasis on the common good. I just don't know that the way we talk about it is biblically how we should be talking about it. But this thoughts on that definition is it's, I got, I got this, this is a, from a, a, a philosophical uh, dictionary. Yeah. Um, do we get off on a rabbit trail if we think about um, how morality and whose perception of morality is right uh, is connected to the common good? No, I don't think so. I think that's a very important part of the conversation. Of Are you going to talk about that? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not tonight. I talked about morality a lot in other time, in other in other places. So here's the thing that's been burning in the yeah. back of my mind yeah. since I heard a message in the last few days talking about um, uh, laying um, the abortion problem in the United States against the um, uh, the Jewish situation in World War II and uh, somebody saying why didn't this church step up and stop that right and so that's and then and this whole this whole issue about um, not being political um, so if the common if we think that the common good is immoral what is our Christian duty right so we will talk about that to a to a certain to a certain extent. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. I think when I when I get a couple slides down, we'll we can chat about that a little okay. bit. Okay. But Catherine. How how is this definition of the common good any different than this idea of thriving? I, I mean. Yeah. I yeah. I feel like 
I can think of lots of members of a given community and lots of members of other given communities. Right. right. I mean, we don't have to look very far. Right. Yeah. To see that there's there could be how many of us in this room, how many definitions of what given, the common good is in, just given in this room. Yeah. And we all profess Jesus. Well, I shouldn't say that. Right. Many right. of us profess right. Jesus as right. Lord. Yeah. So. Yes. So I think the question of given community is a, is a very important question. And so at what level are we defining that, that given community? And I think some of the problems around losing a shared sense of thriving is also a problem of losing a shared sense of common. What is the good that we all hold in common as Americans? It's becoming much more difficult to define these days. We can't agree on tax laws. So we can't agree on much. We can't right. agree on much, right? So I, I think this question of, of so there's there are lots of layers to this question, right? <coughs> all or most. Well, how do you, what, what's, what's yeah. going on there? Right. Is it all? Is it most? Who defines all? Who defines most? Uh, how, do, how do our political processes define those t for whom we share, or with whom we share a common good. Um, what is the difference if you're a citizen of the United States or if you're not, and, but you live in this, these are the conversations that we're really struggling with as a, as a nation state right now. So I think if I'm hearing your question correctly, it's the same challenges we're having with defining what it means to thrive is the same challenge we're having by defining common good. I mean, just think about those two words. Who defines common and who defines good? Because for different groups, we view different things as goods. Whoever's in power gets to define that. Whoever's in power gets to define, and that is the way that it works. And the people who aren't in power are saying, hold on a second. That, why is that? Why do they get to define that? Yeah. I mean, I mean that's, it raises the question, is there such a thing as the common good? Is this even achievable in any way? So that, that, um, that book, Patrick Deneen, the, the book Why Liberalism Failed, his solution is, and, and you, you're seeing this more and more, someone like Wendell Berry, I don't know if you all know who Wendell Berry is, he's a, He's a farmer, and he's a farmer philosopher in Kentucky, uh, and he's he's written poetry, he's written um, short stories, he's written novels, he's written philosophy, and basically the this there's a movement of of localizing. The way that we get back to this is not by having one sense of a national identity that that's impossible to hold together. What you do is you have shared senses of local identities. You can do this more easily on a local level than you can on a national level. But there you have, okay, fine. How do you do that, right? What's the local? Who defines the local? Who moves into the local? Who moves out of the local? If, if you're the local and where Mindy grew up at Sulphur Springs, Texas, there's people who have been kind of the people in charge of Sulphur Springs, Texas for a long time. It's a smaller organization, but there's still us and them. And how do we define us and them? And so this, this question of common good is, it's a very, it's easy to say. It's much more difficult to figure out how it works in practice, even if you do want to, you know, try, a lot of this is a response to globalization and what's going on with globalization and corporate globalization and local sourced food and these kinds of things. That's all kind of going into these conversations. But that's why we have 50 states. Well, it is. I mean, that's that's, that's that was the idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I mean, it's an Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson, the Federalists and the Republicans, and all that good stuff of different visions of what the of the role of the federal state was versus the versus the uh, uh, the states, the local states. Just because yeah. it's hard to define doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Right. It's. Um, well, we we talked about or it's not definable or. It, there is such a thing as common law in England, and it's uh, something that they're struggling. Exists. They're struggling. I mean, you know, in England, is if you get again, it's immigrant. It's it's 
pretty, it's a lot easier to do this if it's a fairly homogenous group. But you start getting different groups moving in. England's really been struggling with this, with, with um, immigration and uh, Islamic, the Islamic presence in England and how that interacts with English law and, and what do you do when an Islamic law that a group of people who are living in your country, when that law contradicts your state law or your common law, do they have the right to live according to their law or are they bound by the laws of the state? Those are the kinds of... I think the word common could be defined as something which is generally agreed upon. Mm -hmm. so what you're saying is... <laughs> that gets very, generally gets agreeing, very complicated. But yeah. that doesn't mean... That, that, it, it, it doesn't mean it's impossible. You can't move toward it. It doesn't mean it's not an ideal to, to, to hold out yeah, there. And, right. But I think that it's, it's just becoming more difficult. And I think it's becoming more difficult as demographics and dynamics in culture and power change. So. All right, now, I want to think about the church and the common good. We're not exactly sure how to define the common good, but just thinking about what is our relationship to the, the community around us, the community in which we live. So we are, according to the New Testament, we are citizens of heaven. That is our primary citizenship. And yet, as citizens of heaven, we reside in earthly states, in earthly communities. As such, however we define it, in some form or fashion, we share in a common good with our neighbors, with the communities in which we dwell, with our, with our families, with our extended families, with our workplaces, with our state, with our nation, that we are, as earthly people, we can't only be citizens of heaven because we live on earth and we're meant to live on earth and we're supposed to live on earth. So we share in a common good with neighbors. And we have a calling to love our neighbors as essential to our life as the church. We are called to love our neighbors. And I have the category for that. I'm not talking here about our church relationships. I'm talking about relationships outside of our church community. I think the category for that is, is common good. Now, members of the church will have different perspectives on how to serve the common good. So the question of voting. I think the question of voting is a common good question. I don't think it's a kingdom of God question. I think the, the, we think about what our role is in voting as citizens. We think about what is good for the nation state in which we live. Now we have to do a lot of deciphering then about what are the criteria we use for that. Is it biblical criteria that we use for that? Is it secular criteria, but that criteria is the best for the operations of the community in which we live. What's the criteria that we use for how we think about how we vote? Um, and so as Christians uh, vote and think about our role in voting or think about just our engagement in the common good, I think it's inevitable that we're going to have different people who come to different conclusions about what is the best thing for the common good. And I don't think we should be surprised that there's not unanimity in the church on that. And we certainly, as we all know here at Central, we don't have unanimity on voting and unanimity on political parties and, and unanimity on our vision of what is best for the common good in which we dwell. I don't think we should be surprised by that. And, and I don't think that should be something that we uh, are, are surprised by. And I think that's where we have ought to have, and I'm think central as a demonstration of a church that does this well, when there's lots of demonstrations of churches that don't do this well, that can have grace towards others who may look at the relationship of 
or, or what's best for the common good differently than others do. So when we think about the church in, in our context, uh, I think we should not be surprised that we're going to have different perspectives on how to serve the common good. And that's okay. And I think maybe even in some ways very healthy for the church. I think also members of the church are going to engage in the life of the earthly community, the common good, through lots of different ways, the participating in the community. Right? We're going to have different engagements with the broader community through our different levels and ways of, of interacting. For some of us, it's, it's workplace. For some of us, it's clubs that we're involved with. For some of us, it's parent uh, organizations that we're involved with, whatever that looks like, right? those those social organizations that aren't ex that aren't the church that are part of the common good, we can, should, ought to be participants in that to contribute to the life of the common good. But the common good is not the kingdom of God. The common good is not the kingdom of God. Therefore, and I think this is where we have struggled a lot with church and politics, um, we must be very clear about the priority of our common ecclesial life when we think about us when we think about we, as citizens of heaven, our identity is as those who belong to the kingdom of God. That is our, our priority. That is our top identifying marker is we belong to the body of Christ, which is the representative of the kingdom of God on earth. The body of Christ, which is the sign of the kingdom of God that is present through the church, but not yet fully present in its fullness. We await that day for the fullness of the kingdom of God's presence. So I think the confusion between the church and the common good has caused the church to put way too much freight in the politics of the state and therefore to define Christianity based on where it fits into the spectrum of the politics of the state, which has then caused a tremendous amount of division within the church along political party lines. And that division is something that Jesus prays against in John 17, something that is so vital to Jesus' teaching about what the church is called to be, to Paul's teaching about what the church is called to be. And I asked this question when we did the Sabbath politics a couple years ago. I asked the question, it's a question I'm still asking, why does the church seem to have become comfortable with the fact that we can be divided along political lines? What's operating behind that? What's going on there? Why have we accepted that our political tribes are more important than our ecclesial unity. I don't think. I'm sorry. But Go ahead. I don't think. I don't think we're comfortable with that. In fact, I think that's part of the deal is that that there's a segment that wants us all to be uh, the same right. politically, and and that if you're a follower of Christ, you got to be this way politically. Right. Yeah. And it's on both sides, for sure. Right. But yeah, I I think there are a lot who are uncomfortable with it. I think this is what we're trying to unwind ourselves from, or what are the what are the reasons behind why there is that drive in certain segments, and what are our options around that? Catherine. Yeah. So, and just like I think I understand what you're saying. <clears throat> what I'm curious about. It's interesting to hear you talk about that we should be comfortable living with discord, if you will, within the church in terms of having different understandings about how we view the common good. Um, and I think 
it can be micro uh, challenges and macro challenges that we disagree. What, and I, maybe I just don't know how, you know, speaking of your eyes to see series, like maybe I just don't know how to see differently um, as somebody who has chosen to vote and have not always voted along the same party lines in my life. <clears throat> How do we as Christ followers separate as, as Americans right. Right. separate out the times when we feel not that I'm trying to assert what I believe is a kingdom of God belief on my society, but believing that I need to use whatever influence I have to care for my neighbor, whether yep. literal or figurative, mm -hmm. in a particular way, and I believe, as I'm sure many other people do, you know, we have these, some of these disagreements are, are not about things like tax laws, but right. about things that affect people's lives. So yep. how, do we, how do we parse out thinking about how Jesus calls us to live and care for our brother and sister and love our brother and sister when it comes to things that we only know in our society that the, the you know, I, I think about the things that we do to affect people's lives here within our church and ministries within our church. Right. And that is so valuable. Right. But on the, that broader scale, how do we how do you, I don't even know if I'm asking my question in any sensible way. Yeah, I, I mean, I think my answer is I don't know yet. All right, I'm, I'm, I think this is part of what we're as a church need to be, because we've been so intertwined that, and this is, I, I think, in a lot of ways, the gist of what this whole series is about is the work we need to do to understand really what an ecclesial identity means in terms of our relationship to the world around us and what does that do to our understanding of what we ought to be um, engaged in in how we shape and form the the morality of a broader of the broader culture what what is our role in that and um, I'm uh, genuinely I think that's that's a lot of what I'm working through myself and, and trying to sort out um, how ought we be using the mechanisms of the, the world around us to love our neighbor? What does that look like? Is it inevitable that to do that is then to move into a authoritarian, impositional kind of a stance towards the culture? What is the proper relationship of the church to that? So I, I, I don't know that I've got a I probably have about as clear as an answer as you have a question. <laughs> so, um, uh, it, it, it strikes me that sacrifice is so much of yeah. you know Jesus's love was sacrificial. Yeah. Um, and and in some way, I think so that as as kingdom people, yeah, we should expect that for us to live as kingdom people is going to mean sacrifice. Right. And for us as Americans who don't believe that we should have to sacrifice anything to right. forbid our independence or freedom or happiness, um, uh, you know, and I think that sometimes is where I think it's around sacrificial issues where I feel like sometimes what I think is the right thing does come at a cost to me, and that's part of why I believe it's the right thing because it comes to the cost to me. Uh, yeah. You're supposed to just give us the answer at the end of this class. Here's the, here's what I, um, what I want to do coming out of this class is, well, I'll, I'll put this up here. I think, I think a step we all need to take as the church is to be very clear that our primary social identity is the church, not the common good. The, the common good is secondary. We have a, a role to play in that, but it is not our primary social identity. 
our primary social identity is the body of Christ. Moving on from that, then I think, then, and maybe this will be what I do in the fall or next spring, then I think, given that, what are more specifically some of these questions about how does this play out in my love of neighbor? What are the implications of this for how I engage in the common good? Um, so I guess what I'm hoping for in my own mind and, and here is that we could leave here tonight with some shared understandings that we've learned over the last few weeks about the church and its relationship to the kingdom of God versus the common good. And from that then start to, to really build more on figuring out the practice of it. Rick. Yeah. It seems to me that um, that Paul and to some extent Jesus were almost ambivalent about the the non believer society and did not attempt to make moral change in unbelievers, but attempted to make believers out of unbelievers and then make believers moral. And, and attempting to make unbelievers moral is probably a losing battle. So um, I think, you know, it's an interesting thing to read Paul's epistles, how little Paul reflects on the world around right. the church. Paul's letters are almost universally letters about who you are as the church and therefore how you are to live your life. And so, like in Romans, right, that's this great theological letter. Philippians, there's theology, but he's also addressing issues in the church. Corinthians, boy, he is hitting the church hard because they're not representing Jesus. Because what Paul, Paul's goal is that Christ be represented well to the world so that people would come and give their allegiance to Jesus so that their allegiances would shift from allegiances to false gods to allegiances to Christ. And the vehicle for doing that is the church. But Paul doesn't spend a lot of time telling the church how to interact with the world. He spends all kinds of time telling the church, get your act together. You've got some things here. In other places, he's very encouraging. But his concern is that the church represents Jesus well to the world. And, and I think you see that very consistently. That's the strategy of the New Testament, is the church. Being the church well is the vehicle through which people will see the rule and the reign of God and therefore come and remove themselves, shift themselves, repent from their allegiance to false gods in order to to join the new community, the eschatological kingdom of God, which is the presence of the church. And so, I mean, this question then about, so, I mean, this is what's challenging, I think, Catherine, and part of your, your question. And the early church, they didn't have the option of voting for a particular vision of how Rome ought to be. Rome was, and they had to figure out how to live in relation to Rome with no power over what Roman society was going to look like and what the, uh, what the social mores of Rome were going to be. We live now on this side of a, of a distinct historical process in which the church went from having no power in the culture so that's why I don't think you see the New Testament reflecting on these questions, because it wasn't an option for the church. Went then into the position of the church being in power, where the church then was an authoritarian, impositional force in the world, to take biblical ideas, biblical concepts, and thrust them onto the broader culture. We're now living in the... the, the uh, rejection of that by the culture and trying to figure out what does this mean for us and what I'm concerned about in this conversation is what I see a lot of theology doing is I think in this time where we're losing our 
understanding of our power. We're, 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 we're losing that presence that we have had. How do we stay relevant in the culture? How do we still have, a, have an impact on the culture? And a lot of that has shifted to this. And then theologizing and making the kingdom of God be something that is playing out in the common good. That's the move I'm concerned about. And I think it's a move that's being made as the church loses power and we're still trying to keep a certain influence that we desire to have. Now, I don't know that that gets us anywhere near your question, but that's, I, I, I think the fact that we live on this side of Christendom as opposed to the, the front side of Christendom creates for us significant challenges that the early church just didn't have because they didn't have, they were living in a democracy. They didn't have any power. They didn't have that kind of a sense of, of what their mission ought to be in the broader culture. Their mission was be the church. So what does that mean for us now on this side, living in a democratic society, living in a society in which we can vote, in which we feel a certain responsibility for how our, how our culture operates? What is our role there? That, I think, is a question we have a lot of work to do to, to unpack and figure that out as we go forward. Were you going to say something? Yeah, better? I was just going to say, I feel like our brothers and sisters in China would have a lot of wisdom to offer because I feel like they live like the early church lived. They, yeah, they underground have, churches, they uh, power, in they, church in communism, mm -hmm. church in these kinds of places have, uh, I think they, their experience is much closer to the early church's experience. All right, um, the church and the kingdom of God. We are a foretaste of the kingdom. We are here to give a vision to the world around us of what it looks like to live under God's rule. We've not been very good at that, but that's what we're supposed to do. We are a distinct polis, as we've talked about, a distinct community, united in Christ. Christ is our common object of love. What is our common good? Jesus. Jesus is our common good. He is to unite us where all other identity markers, as we'll talk about in a minute, all other identity markers are secondary to the identity marker of in Christ. That we belong to Christ. So the church is called to be the new in the midst of the old. The sign of the coming kingdom. Therefore, our goal is to be a witness to the world of God's rule by being the church. And I think this is what you see in the New Testament. This is why you see so much emphasis in the, le in the epistles and the letters of the New Testament of be the church, be the church, be the church. You've got problems in your church. Deal with your problems. You've got people who are doing things that not even the pagans do. You need to deal with that. Right? In, in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, this is what, what Paul is saying to the church. In, in Philippians, you gotta, he calls out two women are having some kind of a fight in the church. And he says, you need to deal with that because this is not good for the witness of Jesus. You are called to be the church. And, and, and that, I think, is why we see so much emphasis in the New Testament on be the church. What does it look like to be the church? Deal with your divisions. Not to say you're gonna have dis you're not gonna have disagreements, but deal with your divisions. This is this is Galatians. This is First Corinthians. This is Philippians. This is Revelation. Revelation. The, the calling of the church is to be the church to persevere, to not give yourselves to the idols of Rome, even though it's going to cost you a lot not to do that. Well, should we tackle evangelicalism and race in 20 minutes? Mm -hmm. well, yeah. oh, oh. <laughs> All right. This shouldn't come as a surprise to you that I believe that um, the problem of the church and race, and I hope I don't have to go into a whole lot of convincing that there have been significant problems of the church and race in our, in our history and the broader history of the church. I think the problem of the church and race is rooted primarily in our failure to hold 
our common object of love as that which is our primary identity marker. To hold Christ as our primary object of love. The church has failed to live out the fundamental renewal of social relations inherent in the gospel. By that I mean the church. Our failure to understand the centrality of the church to God's mission is a significant contributor to why we have had the horrible problems of racism and division that we have had in the church for many, many years, and particularly in the white evangelical church in the United States. Salvation in Christ, as we've talked about, is not merely the salvation of the individual soul. Salvation in Christ is the establishment of a new social reality, the church. And when we grasp the significance of that and the demand of that for what it means to our self-understanding, that's when the weight of the significance of what it means to be a member of the body of Christ can start to, to really sink in. How fundamentally being a member of the body of Christ is to reshape our thinking about ourselves and others. And the ways that we evaluate ourselves and the ways that we evaluate others get swept away when we become members of the body of Christ. So, I think that the failure to stress the social element of salvation, the church, right, as evangelicals, we've stressed the individual element, get your soul saved and punch your card to heaven. The failure to stress the social element of salvation has caused us to seek identities and interests with common objects other than Christ. We have put other common objects into the center of our self-definition and our communal definitions that are not Jesus Christ. And when we do that, we create significant problems in the church because we open up the church to all kinds of division. And we've seen this nationalism, the problem that the church has had with nationalism for so many years and in so many different ways and in so many different contexts and so many different cultures. It's not unique to one place or another. It's, it's, a, it's an ongoing challenge for the church. Race, of course, what we're talking about here particularly, uh, economic self-interest. Economic self-interest has been a significant challenge for how the church understands our identity. And what this has meant is that in the church there's been a failure to have our ecclesial social identity override all other identity markers that we're that we can have as people who are people who live on the earth. So how as Christians are we to think about us and them? We've been talking about us and them a little bit tonight. As Christians, how should we think about us and them? In my view, the gospel doesn't eliminate us and them thinking. The gospel doesn't eliminate us and them thinking. I think as you read through the scriptures, as you read through the New Testament, there is an us and a them in the scriptures. It is contained in the scriptures. Now, it's not national, it's not race. It's not economic, it's not class, it's not any of those things that we tend to use as us-them markers. And I think it's important to recognize that there is an us-them in Scripture, but it radically challenges and fundamentally reshapes the way that we think about us and them. So what is the proper us and them in Scripture? I suggest the proper us in them in scripture is in Christ and in Adam. This is the category that we have in the New Testament. And it 
connects with the eschatology that we talked about early on a few weeks ago, the old and the new. That in the New Testament, particularly in the book of Romans, you have these two categories of human sociality. One is a sociality that has as its head, Adam. The other is a sociality that has as its head, Christ, or the second Adam, as Christ is defined. So you're off the hook. You can be the second Adam, Adam. You don't have to be the first Adam. You can be the third Adam, whatever you want to be. Yeah, just not the first. (laughs) So we've got these two socialities in Scripture. There is the community of humanity that belongs to Adam, and that's the old. And there is the community of humanity that belongs to Christ, and that is the new. And that new is the church, the body of Christ. So again, I I think it's important to say that the gospel doesn't eliminate division or us-them. And we've talked about this verse a number of times. If you're going to be my disciple, you have to hate your father and your mother. Christ calls for an allegiance to himself that also therefore demands the breaking of other allegiances, other identity markers. So there isn't a, an elimination of division or us, them, but the gospel fundamentally changes the nature of how we think about us and them. And you can see this in a number of different places, just a couple of verses that I want us to think about regarding this. So 2 Corinthians 5, 16 and 17, Paul is reflecting on the results of the resurrection of Jesus in 2 Corinthians, kind of as a, as a theme of 2 Corinthians, but certainly in this section of 2 Corinthians, he's thinking about what happens as a result of Jesus' resurrection. And you probably know 2 Corinthians 5.17. It's a pretty common verse for people who are, who are Bible people. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, and the new is here. That's language we've been talking a lot about lately. Old, new, in Christ. These are definitional terms. These are identity terms that Paul is talking about. If you belong to Christ, you now belong to that which is new. This doesn't mean you yourself. I think we can misinterpret this to thinking, well, if I'm in Jesus, then I'll be new and I won't struggle with old stuff. It's not what Paul's talking about here. He's not saying if you're in Jesus, then you'll be sinless. And then what those of us who find out, hey, I'm not sinless, then think, well, am I in Jesus? Yeah, you are in Jesus. You belong to what is new. You still have, you're going to have your problems with your old self, but your social identity has changed. You now belong to the eschatological community of God, the final community of God, the body of Christ. You know verse 16? We don't know verse 16 quite as well, I think. But Paul says this in verse 16. We no longer regard anyone from a worldly point of view. Or he says a fleshly point of view. The identity markers of the flesh. The identity markers of the old. The identity markers of worldliness. A list of those identity markers that we can, we can check off here. What are the identity markers of the old world? They are, how much money do you have? What color are you? What nation are you a citizen of? What is your educational level? What is your gender? Go through the whole list of all those identity markers. And Paul says, we no longer think about people according to these categories. That is old way of thinking categorization. And we don't consider people that anymore. We no longer regard anyone from a worldly point of view. And then he goes on to say, though once we regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. And I think Paul, that's a, that's a royal we that he is using. He's, talk, he's saying, I once regarded Christ in this way. That's why Paul was going to kill Christians. Right? This is why Paul set out to eliminate Christianity. Because he viewed Christ from a worldly category. And then, when he was on his way to Damascus, and Jesus, the resurrected Jesus showed up, and Paul found himself on the dirt, 
and blind, he reconsidered how he viewed Jesus. And now he doesn't any longer view Jesus from a worldly perspective, from any of those categories. Jesus now has to be viewed as an entirely different category. And therefore, all who belong to Christ, who are united with Christ, now in the body of Christ, we have to also make this fundamental shift of how we view people and how we categorize people and how we categorize us and them. And we, the church, are no longer allowed to categorize us and them by any of the categories of the old. We can't do that. We no longer regard anyone from a worldly point of view. And then what follows that is, if you belong to Christ, if you are in Christ, the old is gone. Your ways of thinking about people, your ways of understanding the world, that is gone. And the new has come. And then Paul goes into saying, and we're ambassadors of reconciliation. That's how it goes on in 2 Corinthians 5. What's our job as the church? Our job as the church is to demonstrate to the world what reconciliation looks like because we no longer consider anyone from the categories of the old. Therefore, what we ought to be able to do is show the world a people who are reconciled with one another because our unity is now found in something fundamentally different than all of the unities that the world seeks in its own identity market. Um, do you think there's a sense in which the anyone there is not just the believers, but that we should be looking at unbelievers not just from a worldly point of view, but as, yes. as eternal souls? Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And so our vision of the them also fundamentally changes. And, and I'll talk about this in a minute, but... One of the problems the church has had is in our us-them thinking, we have had a very adversarial us-them relationship to those people outside of us. That is not at all how the church ought to interact. We need, I think we need to keep the us-them categories because those are biblical categories. But we also have to fundamentally understand this changes our relationship to them very different way of viewing them and how we are to engage in relationship with those who belong to Adam. Okay, so we no longer view people through the categories of the world. We are in Christ. This is a very important way that Paul thinks about things. The church is in Christ, belongs to Christ. What does that mean? That means that those who come to Jesus are now brought into a new social reality a new social location. We belong to the new community. The body of Christ is the new creation that Paul is talking about in 2 Corinthians 5. And it's a sign of the new creation that is going to come when Jesus comes to establish his earthly kingdom over the whole of the creation. We're not there yet. Romans 8, the world is groaning, the creation is groaning, we're groaning, everyone's groaning because we're under the weight of sin. Still, the world is, is groaning under the weight of sin as we await the revelation of the children of God as we await the new creation. So our job as the church, as we are awaiting the new creation, is to represent to the world as a sign, as a foretaste, of what that new creation will look like, and that's primarily around reconciled relationships. Genesis 3, 26 through 28. You probably know verse 28. I mean, sorry, Galatians 3, 26 through 28. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you all are all one in Christ Jesus. Okay? You don't consider each other according to these worldly categories anymore. Now, Paul's not saying there that there aren't people who are born Jews and people who are born Gentiles. There aren't, there, 
obviously it, there are still men and women in the church. He's not saying that those fundamental things about us change, but he's saying in your relationship with one another, you look at these uh, different, these are all combative, typically combative relationships that he's talking about here, right? Relationships of conflict, Jew and Gentile, significant relations of conflict in the world in which Paul is writing this. Uh, slave and free, power relationships, male-female power relationships. You no longer relate to one another through these categories and through these power structures. This is not the way that you are to, to live with one another. Uh, I'm going to, after Easter, I'm going to do a, a little four-week series on the book of Philemon uh, and, and explore this theme from the book of Philemon, which is about, as you probably know, a slave that ran away from a Christian owner, and Paul connected with that slave, and now Paul's writing a letter back to the owner, essentially to say, I want you to receive him back, but no longer as your slave, now as your brother. And I think there's a lot in Philemon about this, this very, these ideas. And so we're going to reflect more on that as we uh, get after Easter. Doug? What about power structures that um, exist that the people in power don't even know about? Last night I was discussing um, condo prices mm. and addresses in Cathedral Hill yeah. with some other people yeah. and selling a property, what it's worth. And yeah. then I thought, wow, I have the luxury right. of talking about house prices. Right. And there are so many people that don't. Don't. Yeah. Um, what if you don't even know that there's a difference? How do you uh, address it? How does it fit into this conversation? Um, I got four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to answer. I just bring it up. It's. I think the question of of structural advantage. Right. How do we as Christians relate to structural advantage? I still am I'm wrestling with all of that as I sit in my house that is a house in a neighborhood that is one that um, for a variety of reasons I can afford and, and other people can't. What do I do with that? We had that I'm still not you sure. You live <laughs> east of Snelling. Right, right. If you lived a little bit west of Snelling, your property would be worth even more. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's yeah. Yeah. Um, so what do we do with that? As, as people who inhabit the earth, what do we do with that? Maybe that'll be the next one. Okay, so we know verse 28. Well, verse 26 and 27 say, So in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ and have clothed, your, have clothed yourselves with Christ. That's all identity language. Right? Baptism is an identity marker. So when we baptize on Easter, which we're, we're going to do here in, in whatever that is, six or seven weeks from now, when we baptize on Easter, this is how we need to be thinking about it. These people are stepping into this water as an identity marker of belonging to Christ. Their fundamental allegiances have changed. They no longer belong to the old. They now belong to the new. That's what he's saying there. You were baptized into Christ and you've clothed yourself with Christ. This is all about who you are. That is what leads into this. You so in Christ Jesus, you are children of God through faith. All of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. There is, therefore, neither Jew nor Gentile. Why? Because you're in Christ. That's why. That's your identity now. That's your identity. Your, the core thing about who you are is that. You're in Christ. Everything else... Again, it doesn't mean that there aren't women and there aren't men and there aren't Jews and there aren't Gentiles. It doesn't. But those things are no longer what is fundamental about us. You are in Christ. All right. I'm going to do implications for the church and race in a minute and a half. <laughs> um, union with Christ demands a fundamental reorientation to our thinking about us and them. Who is us? Us is whoever 
belongs to Christ. From whatever race, from whatever gender, from whatever nationality, from whatever economic level, from whatever social class, us is belong, who belongs to Christ. So we don't draw the lines where we used to draw the lines when we didn't belong to Christ. The world draws the lines here. You, there are lines, and it's in Christ. But whoever is there, that is us. The body of Christ can have no division based on human markers of identity. Because Christ, Christ transcends these markers, and so does his body. Amen. So, the way to progress for the church on unity demands, particularly around race, an acknowledgement and a repentance of racial identity seeking that has been so common in the church and, and has been a significant part of the white evangelical Christian tradition has been this racial identity marking and declaring that this is in, in disobedience to the gospel. Paul in Philemon is he's kind of he's given a soft touch to Philemon there's a lot of flattery. It's a really interesting. There's 25 verses in Philemon, and about 12 of those are Paul kind of, you know, introduce, introducing the letter and, and, and talking about how he appreciates Philemon, and then he ends the letter with, make a room for me so that when I come, I can stay with you, and, you know, all this stuff. But then in the middle, few verses, it's a little, it, it feels a little bit soft, but he's driving at, you can no longer consider Onesimus as you once did. You are not allowed to do that anymore. And in that context, it's not necessarily the racial context, but it certainly is what that translates into our context significantly. We have to have acknowledgement and repentance of the way that evangelicals have benefited from, from power. And I've confessed this to you before. I've, as one who is in authority in a church, as a pastor, I, I struggle with this question of power and authority and and, and how I am to live that out and what that looks like for, for the church and, and for us. I don't necessarily have all the answers to that, but uh, it's something I, I think about. There's a nice phrase by a, a theologian named Gray Thompson called lived repentance. And he talks about these as three things that the, the evangelical church needs to do in the race conversation. One is embrace the sufferings of love, which we've never really done before because we've been in power. We haven't had to embrace suffering because when you're in power, you inflict the suffering, you don't yeah, receive right. the suffering. So how we need to put ourselves in positions of embracing the sufferings of love in our relationships to our sisters and brothers. He talks about institutional dying to self, not just personal dying to self, but institutional dying to self. What does it mean for institutions that have benefited from power and, and, and race? to die to ourselves. And then the third thing he talks about is giving up the benefits of our inheritance. There are things we have inherited through these structures that we have to reckon with. What are things we may have to give up and lay down in order to live as Christ to each other? Oops. Sorry, I had one more slide here and then we'll be done. Um, I don't think that the way to ecclesial unity... Uh, let's do this. Anyway, uh, I don't think that the way to ecclesial unity is through the mechanisms of the state. I think we have ecclesial work to do that isn't through the mechanisms. I think the state has a lot of work to do and we've contributed to the challenges in the state. I don't think the way to ecclesial unity is through the mechanisms of the state. And then uh, to be the body of Christ, uh, to be the body of Christ is to have a clear vision of what it means to be the body of Christ. So I'm gonna leave you with the, uh, the question, are you still are you still evangelical? Think about that. 
With a few adjectives. <laughs> with a few adjectives, you're okay with it? <laughs> the word I would suggest, if I was to replace it, would be confessional. Confessional Christianity. That we belong to a confession of the church. That is what marks us as the church. I'm not going to make a big argument for that, but I think confessional is a, is a word that, that would be... Would be it had its own problems, but I think it would be helpful for us as well. So, all right, we're done. Sorry, I held you five minutes over. So I apologize. But uh, thanks for your time. Thanks for your attention. Feedback, thanks. thoughts, and Thank ideas. You. And please help me. Let's uh, let's encourage one another as we think about what it means to be the church. That's what we're here for, right? Amen. All right. I think anybody that we say the Lord's Prayer with, our Father who art in heaven, and for